we pick up our examination of the pastoral ministry of the Puritans with Richard Greenham. Now, Richard Greenham, who lived from 1542 to 1594, is, is probably one of the best known exemplars in the Elizabethan period of pastoral ministry. Uh, he would, in, in terms of his influence and impact on pastoral ministry is concerned, he would probably be only second uh, to Richard Baxter when we consider the whole breadth of uh, Puritan pastoral and uh, devotional theology altogether. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, Richard Greenham, as you can see here in your notes, is kind of a uh, kind of it fa kind of falls a little halfway uh, here between uh, Perkins and uh, and Richard and Richard Sibbs. Richard si Richard Sibbs would probably be the next very important. Um, a Puritan pastor in this regard, not just in terms of, not just in terms of, um, you know, pastoral practice, but very importantly with regards to what we would call devotional theology, and hence that very important work of his on the Bruised Reed, and that's why I included. That's why I actually required you to read that, in addition to uh, Perkins, and in addition, obviously, to Richard Baxter. Now, with regard to Richard Greenham, unlike some of the others we've examined at this point, we don't know a whole lot about his early life, except that uh, he, went, he began his studies in Cambridge in 1559, uh, enrolling at uh, Pembroke Hall uh, there, at, um, there in Cambridge, was, which would be one of the colleges, uh, part, which was then part of Cambridge University, by the way, Oxford and Cambridge both still work this way. It's, it's kind of interesting. When I did part of my uh, postgrad uh, at Oxford, I remember um, there was an American. I was I forgot what I, I forgot where I was headed. I think I was headed over to the to a Maudlin. I don't remember now. I think that's probably where it was. But anyway, I'm on my way, and and the Amer and there was uh, I think there was an American tourist you know there was an American tourist and he comes by and he asked me where Oxford where Oxford University was and I pointed and I looked around and I went like this and I said well here it is and by that I meant that unlike <coughs> well unlike the pa unlike the pastors college here unlike uh, maybe some of the universities uh, you know, here in um, you know here in uh, you know here in Otis, or even most of those in the United States, whose ca whose campuses are all um, are all kind of centered in one location. Oxford and Cambridge are very different. I mean, the entire the cities themselves just about are the universities, and that's because you know, with respect to both Oxford and Cambridge, you have this large well, for lack of a better word, corporation called the university that consists, in the case of Oxford, of about 23 or 24 colleges, individual colleges. And the same thing applies to Cambridge. So, uh, today, I mean, today in, uh, today in the UK, just as much as uh, back then in this regard, if somebody, wanted, if somebody wanted to, wants to attend either Oxford or Cambridge, they have to be accepted well, by the university as a whole, that's kind of the corporational aspect of it, but then you have to be accepted by an individual college within the university. So, that was the case here with Grenham. He, uh, he was accepted by the university, the University of Cambridge, but then he was accepted by a specific college that was part of the university known as Pembroke Hall, and so that's where he matriculated. And again, we don't know a whole lot about his time at Cambridge, except that he, on record, he earned his uh, BA degree in 1564, his MA degree in 1567. And upon receiving his MA, he was elected a fellow. Well, what was that? Well, a fellow was, con well, to try to simplify it as much as possible, a fellow was kind of like a teacher. 
uh, he, he was a person who did some uh, limited teaching and tutoring, um, mainly, of, mainly of undergraduates. And usually at either Oxford or Cambridge, you had to receive your master's to do that. So if you, once you received your master's, then you were elected by your individual college to be a fellow. So here you would be, so here uh, in that position for a limited period of time, you would be uh, teaching under, you'd be teaching and tutoring undergraduate students. And then, and that was for a very short, that was for a limited period of time, at which point then a person with his master's uh, from either Oxford or Cambridge would then decide as to whether or not they wanted to go further, uh, you know, go further in this case to a BD, uh, to a BD if they're interested in um, you know, entering the ministry, uh, pursue some <coughs> pursue some other academic course, or then <coughs> or just simply or just simply you know, get or just simply uh, go off into some other kind of service, whether it be uh, whether it be teaching at some kind of a school, whether it be the tutor of a of a um, of a noble person's children, whether it be to serve the state in some way, and sometimes, even without a BD, just with the just with the MA, sometimes a person can go and be the rector or the pastor of a church in a parish. So there are any number of things a person could have done. Well. Well, Greenham was a fellow there uh, from 1567 to 1570. Now we come to his ministry. And in 1570, he becomes the rector. Now, by the way, in the Church of England, um, when, you come when, when you're doing some of this kind of reading and you come across that word rector, the rector is just another word for pastor. And the reason for that being that in this tradition, the bishop of the diocese is considered, quote unquote, is considered, quote unquote, the pastor for all the churches in the diocese, and the rector, which really, which really comes from the word director, is the person then who performs the pastoral responsibilities for that parish uh, on behalf of the bishop. So that's why that's why that word rector is used. Uh, in this context. So, but for our purposes here, a rector here at this time uh, in the Church of England, uh, certainly under the Elizabethan settlement, is just simply a, it's just simply a pastor. Now, at the time, now it's interesting, at the time of his arrival, uh, the congregation there at Dry Drayton, which was a small farming village uh, just northwest of Cambridge, uh, you could still, I mean, if you go to England today, you could still, you could, you could still see it. It's still, it's still somewhat, it's still somewhat quaint. But when he arrived uh, to assume pastoral responsibilities at uh, Dry Drayton uh, there in 1570, the congregation consisted of about 250 people. He labored there for three years uh, until he married. Um, a physician's widow by the name of Catherine Bound, uh, and he and uh, uh, Greenham, when he married her, uh, acquired a settled family already because she was a widow with four children. So, so here, so here, so here he is. He's a young, he's a young pastor. He's single. Um, he labors for three. He labors for three years, and then in the midst of all this, he acquires a ready, what we call a ready-made family, wife and uh, uh, the widow of a local physician, along with his four children. And so now he is assuming the responsibility of uh, maintaining and caring for this already made family. Now, it seems. That uh, Greenham, like anyone else, although he's a pastor, is hu obviously he's human, and uh, as a human being, he's going to have his share of frustrations. Um, even with marriage, yes, even marriage, believe it or not, has its source of frustrations, as any of us who's married can attest very clearly. It's not. Yes, it's yes. It, it, it is joyous. It's a blessed estate, and all of that. This is all very true. 
However, anybody who's married will also tell you that it has its share of frustrations. And it's no, it is no different uh, with uh, green. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, he kind of goes in, he kind of goes into marriage uh, with a certain degree of um, of hesitation, uh, believing that. Um, and gentlemen, I will let you draw your own conclusions regarding this. But he goes into marriage thinking that. Primarily, it's a, it's, a cure, it's a cure for fornication. And by the way, he's not the only one in this period to believe this. Uh, Augustine, ar Augustine uh, argu uh, arguably believed the same thing, but then, if we, but then from we, what we know about Augustine's life is very obvious as to why um, he, ha he has what we might call something of a relatively low view of marriage, he doesn't despise it because he knows it was ordained by God, but uh, given, just given some of the problems that Augustine had before his conversion, one can understand how he would, uh, how he would see marriage as just another, as just as really a way to, uh, you know, to uh, to prevent fornication, and um, and so there's a tradition of that that does continue in much of the church. Uh, throughout the centuries, which also provided the basis uh, for, for what in the medieval church would become mandatory celibacy. Now, obviously, the Reformation challenged a lot of that, and, and, certainly, in the church of, and certainly in the Church of England under Elizabeth I, that was the case as well. And so that's kind of the, that's kind of the overall context for Greenham. Well, nevertheless, he goes into it with this uh, degree of hesitation uh, wherein uh, is a marriage is initially viewed as kind of the last resort to avoid fornication. However, over time, because he was married, and as he grew in his marriage, as he grew in his relationship, he came to regard marriage very highly. And in fact, one of the most distinguished, one of the probably one of the most distinguishing features of Greenham's career as a pastor is that he held, ironically enough, frequent premarital counseling sessions with people before he would marry them. Now, it's important to, and I hope if if we if we haven't if we haven't gleaned anything at this point, I'm hoping one thing that we do glean from these individuals that we've examined, and that is that church life for them was not idyllic. It was far it was far it was far from it was far from ideal. We certainly saw this in the in the case with Richard Baxter yesterday. Uh, we certainly saw this even last week with uh, with with John with John Calvin. It was. Uh, pastoral life, yes, even in the 16th century, believe it or not, was not a cakewalk. There is, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, and gentlemen, here's where you can help me out in, in terms of comparison here. I'm not sure what the impression here in Ethiopia would be, but I do know that oftentimes among American evangelicals, there's this tendency to romanticize some of these periods. Oh, the... Pastoring in the Reformation must have been a, must have been this wonderful thing in which everybody was just godly, and and great. No. They had pastors in the 16th century, as we've all as we have gathered already from last week and for this week, had faced some serious problems, faced some serious challenges, and it was no different with Richard Greenham in his ministry at Dry Drayton. This church, was very this church was very challenging, as you could see here. One thing, that he, one thing he discovered was that most of the people in this congregation, hence that parish, that area, had little understanding of biblical piety. By biblical piety, we just simply mean, in this case, how one regards his or her relationship with God. There was little, or he discovered as a pastor, there was li not only was there little or no understanding of it, there were a good number of people who didn't even care. Yes. And I'm sure, in, 
and I'm, and I'm, something tells me that human nature being what it is, um, you, it, chances are there's a good bit of that even here in Otis. Maybe for different, sure, maybe for different reasons, different contextual reasons, but I'm sure, I'm sure that as people, as men preparing for the pastoral office, and even being part and even being actively involved in this work, I'm sure that you have encountered people who probably could care less, let alone know anything about to have about how one should go about his or her you know, personal relationship with God. Well, Richard Greenham discovered the same kinds of things uh, in the in the in the church there in Dry Drayton. He also noticed that a good number of people in this parish, in this church, neglected prayer. Prayer was not a priority for them. Like people we know, probably even, even with ourselves at some point, they had, people had other priorities. And from what we understand with respect to what Greenham speaks about in some, of his, uh, in some of his works. This was also the case here as well. People neglected the hearing of the word. See, here's the, now, what, now we might come back and say, okay, what do you mean by that? Well, people tend not to go to church. Well, wait a second, I thought there, was, I thought there were laws in place and all that. Well, yes, that's true. There were laws in place. Yes, the you know, senior, yes, the, either the senior or the junior warden who served on the vestry, which would be kind of like the elders board of that parish. Sure, they could track the person down for dereliction in church attendance and, um, and find them for it and all of that. But as with anything else, gentlemen, laws are only as good as the willingness of the responsible parties to enforce them. So if you have ward, so if you have in this context uh, wardens who could care who themselves are pretty complacent, and they could care less about enforcing any of this, then is all kind of moot. So with all that said, Greenham is dealing with a good number of people who <coughs> who at best are giving scant attention to the preaching of the word. And apparently there, there, are some, there are still some significant residual effects from late Roman, late Roman Catholicism, late medieval Roman Catholicism, in which many of the lay people who are not, who are not instructed in the, um, in the minutia of uh, the Roman Catholic dogma of transubstantiation and all, what all that involved, uh, regarded uh, the sacrament very superstitiously. Uh, there, and so in some of these villages, yes, I mean, and by the way, this is also part of the problem with the Reformation being implemented in some of these places, that more oftentimes there was a disconnect between the intention of those initiating the Reformation and trying to implement it, and then its reception in a lot of these areas especially some of these remote areas. Uh, in this case, um, not, terribly far from, not terribly far from Cambridge, even though it's still in the southern part of England, but some of the worst problems in terms of trying to implement any of this practically with regards to reception were, was in the north, was in the northern part of England. So, but in this case, this happens to be in the southern part. Well, people regard, well there are people who regarded the sacrament or the or what we would call the Lord's Supper, as kind of a, as kind of a magical phenomenon. And so, and that's because there was a misunderstanding at the local level as to what the Roman Catholic Church meant by, you know, tra by transubstantiation and by, uh, and by, oh, you know, the, you know, the mass being a sacrifice and all of that. <coughs> 
Well, that, well, the theology behind that, whether, when, whether we agree with it or not, is still somewhat sophisticated and does involve a certain degree of philosophical explanation. Well, <clears throat> most ordinary people didn't think in those terms. They thought, the, they thought, ooh, the priest pronounces these Latin words, the meaning of which I don't know, and something happens. This, this wafer suddenly turns into Jesus' body. Hmm. And that wine turns into his blood. Wow. Gentlemen, uh, <coughs> help me out here, here in, uh, here in Ethiopia. Has, uh, um, does it, it, is the phrase hocus pocus common here in Ethiopia? Well, it, well, if somebody is if somebody is kind of stereo, is kind of stereotyping uh, some kind of ma some kind of uh, magic act like in a cartoon like in a cartoon or something like that. All right, there's you know there's a you know there's a cartoon witch or a magician running around saying hocus pocus, and then something happens. All right, I just wanted to be sure because I don't want to I don't want to use illusions here that are completely and totally um, not relevant. <clears throat> But, by the way, this idea of hocus pocus, which we, which, which, we, which we kind of laugh at when we watch cartoons, actually had, I kid you not, gentlemen, actually had a serious source of origin. And it goes back to situations like this, because in the late Middle Ages, in the 16th century, in parts of Europe, people not knowing Latin and hearing the priest doing the entire you know, communion liturgy in Latin when they come to um, you know, ho um, hoc, hoc est corpus meum. That's the Latin from the Vulgate, the Latin, the Latin rendering of our Lord's words, this is my body, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body. Well, if you're, if you're, just, some, if you're just some farmer in some village, and you most likely don't know anything about Latin. You go in, you go in there, you go to mass because you're, well, because the priest says you're, you have to, and you've got to receive this, and you need to receive this thing because you get grace. You don't know anything, you don't know, you, you have no clue as to how all this works, but you know some kind of magic words are pronounced by the priest. So you can just imagine. The, uh, the 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 you know the medieval farm you know the late medieval or early modern farmer, or you know tra or shopkeeper whoever going you know, going to the parish church, um, which is still be Catholic. And here the priest is muttering something in Latin. He says, "Hoc est," you know, he's quoting the words of our Lord in the words of institution, "Hoc est corpus meum," and then the and the poor, and the guy <laughs> the guy's listening to it like. Oh, hmm, what do you say? Hmm, hocus, po hocus pocus, okay. Oh, so he says these magic words, and I don't understand. Ooh, and that piece of bread turns into Jesus' body, and somehow if I eat this, if I eat this thing that has been miraculously turned into Jesus' body, then somehow I'm going to receive this thing called grace, according to what the priest says, and I should be good to go. That's how a lot of people viewed it. And then, gentlemen, we you read some good night, you read some story, you read some of the stories from the late Middle Ages, early 16th century about some of about some of the superstitious stuff that would be that would be attached to this. Um, you know, magic, you know, you know, magical, you know, magical, you know, magical occurrences associated with the consecrated host and all this business, and then it just gets it just it gets bizarre it just gets bizarre just gets bizarre especially when you're dealing with an, a period in that part in this case in this part of England where there is what we call syncretism and by syncretism i mean in this case the mixture of folk magic which was very common there'd be a mixture of folk magic with elements of christianity and oftentimes when you read some of those accounts it involves something regarding the, the consecrated Eucharist, which was 
which was turned into Jesus' body, if they were following this line of reasoning, when the priest, when the priest pronounced these mysterious magical Latin words over it. Ho, hil, hocus, corpus, meum. Oh, hocus, pocus. And, that's how, and, and by the way, that's how this idea of hocus pocus came about. Well, that's what I mean in this case when we say that Greenham confronted this in this parish. So there are a lot of people who regard the sacrament in this very, very, quote unquote, superstitious way. And then, neglecting the Sabbath. What did that mean? Well, it depends on whom, it depends on whom you ask. In this particular context, most likely neglecting the Sabbath just means not just simply not making the worshiping of God on Sunday a priority. Why should I? I mean, let's, well, let's, ima let's imagine this town, Dry Drayton, in the late 16th century. Well, why on earth should I, why, good night, why on earth should I go to church? Especially if, the war, especially if the wardens aren't doing anything to enforce it. They're acting just, the wardens are acting just like me. Um, why, should I bo why, should I bo why should I bother messing around with any of that when I can just go to the, when I can just go to the tavern, drink my ale, hang out, play cards, and, um, and do all that. And especially, and hey, if the, if the junior and senior warden are doing it, and if... And if the minister, before Greenham arrived, was doing it, pff, why not? So, you t so this apparently this was the kind of attitude that was very much prevalent in that uh, in that community where Greenham uh, came to pastor. So these are the all this to say, gentlemen, uh, these are the kinds of challenges that he is facing as a pastor. All, all the, so all this to say that uh, pa that uh, pastoral ministry in the 16th century had its had its same share of challenges just as pastoring any place here in Ethiopia would. Different contextual reasons, obviously, but the challenges are there nevertheless. <clears throat> However. Greenham arrives, and by God's good grace, he becomes all the more dedicated to his ministry. And what's interesting about Greenham in this regard is he goes into this church, he goes into this pastoral situation, he sees what pretty much is the deplorable state of things, and rather than get discouraged, I'm sure he was discouraged, and obviously, I mean, he's a human being, of course he's going to be discouraged, but rather than succumbing to a sense of discouragement and wanting to leave, by the grace of God, and as we all know, it's only by the grace of God, he became even more determined to pastor faithfully, knowing full well this was not going to be easy. This was going to be hard. But he's going to, but by the grace of God, he realized that as he endeavored to be faithful, in his, well, first of all, in his own relationship with the Lord, number one, and then secondly, in his pastoral ministry, he was going to trust God to bring about the, right, the, the desired changes and results. And that's what it takes. I mean, we speak about going into a tough, we speak about going into a tough situation where you the pastor may have a you the pastor may have a vision for how what God for what you know for how, what God is going to do by way of the ministry he's appointed you to but as we often know there is a disconnect between what we come in envisioning believing that this is the burden that God has given us and then the reality that we find. Hmm, the people in this church are not as, don't really care about spiritual things as I thought they might. Hmm, so what challenge does that pose 
And then how do we, by God's, and then how do I, by God's grace as a pastor, meet that challenge? And it does come to a continuous acknowledgement and pleading for God's grace. And that was, and that was certainly the case here with Richard Greenham, and it is the case with every one of us. <clears throat> Because, I mean, depending on where God leads, I mean, the, the goal here, I believe, and, um, is for you gentlemen, eventually, depending on where, how God leads, is to go and plant churches in various, you know, various places. You know, either, he, either here in Otis, surrounding area, perhaps even other parts of the country. Well, obviously, you gentlemen know already what some of these areas are like. I mean... You're going, I mean, I've, I had some conver, I've had some conversations with a couple of you as to what some of this is like. You go, you go, you go in, you, you go in to minister to some places and uh, the, let's just, to put it very mildly, uh, the reception is not necessarily all that positive. Am I right? There, I mean, and I'm and I'm and I'm deliberately employing understatement when I say that the reception to you going in there with the gospel and and doing pastoral ministry and so forth in some areas is not is not pos- is not necessarily positively received. Well, people like Greenham face similar things. Maybe not. Maybe maybe not. Not vi- not not in the form of violence per se. But certainly in the form of, of, adi- of, of attitude mixed, in this case, with a certain degree of residual superstition by way of some kind of syncretism. Okay, well, here's, here's, <coughs> here's the Christian aspect of this. Here's the, you know, in, in this case, here's the folk magic aspect of this. And somehow we've appropriated our understanding of the sacrament this way. And now, here's Greenham as a reformed pastor, which is what he is, needing to deal with this and all the effects of that. But rather than run from it, which would be the natural human tendency apart from God's grace. By God's grace, he became even all the more dedicated to the pastoral ministry there because of such a glaring need. And so it's towards this end, as I said, he devotes himself even more by God's grace to the ministry he has given him there. <clears throat> and, so, and, so in the, and so in this regard, we see this playing itself out throughout his career there at Dry Drayton, both in, ter- uh, in terms of his life, in terms of his ministry, and also... In terms, of his, in terms of his writings, what's really interesting about this, as a, he, viewed, he viewed his writing on various subjects, and, and he was a very prodigious writer, um, as also an extension of his pastoral ministry uh, with regard to many, many other different things pertaining to it. So at this point, what I'd like to do is now look at, ver- look at various specific aspects uh, of his ministry, given the context uh, in which now he's going to minister. The first of these has to do with his, with his pastoral teaching. Now notice here, gentlemen, I didn't say preaching, I said teaching. We'll come back to preaching in a moment. I said teaching. Particularly, and, it's, and again, I, I'm, I'm always struck by, God, by instances of God's providence. Uh, I'm struck that we're now bringing this up once again, following from what we discussed regarding Baxter yesterday, the song that you played here just before class, and what you're going to be doing Sunday morning. <coughs> and this all has to do with the incorporation of the Heidelberg Catechism. And once again, in terms of Greenham's teaching, he is concerned about catechizing. There's a common pattern here, isn't there? Uh, we, uh, we, saw this with per- we saw this with Perkins. Yesterday, writ large, we saw it with Baxter. I mean, this is, I mean the, the importance of catechizing uh, 
on in, in, in it, not just at the church, but even with, but very importantly, catechizing individual families. That's one of the distinctive features of Baxter's work. But now here, we come to it again with respect to Richard Greenham. So, he, so really, the essence, of his te- the essence of his pastoral teaching was catechizing. And specifically, he catechized for two hours every Thursday and then every Sunday between the two services, between the morning service and, and what would be the, you know, the, the, evening, the evening service. Because as, because as a minister in the Church of England, he's, fo- he's using the Book of Common Prayer. So obviously he's following the order of morning prayer. He's following the order of evening prayer. Now, evening, now obviously evening prayer in England probably would might have been a little depending on the time of year it might have been it might have been a little er, might have been a little earlier uh, because um, in in England it get uh, during the winter it gets dark it gets dark a lot it gets well it gets dark a lot sooner so it probably one could conceivably see evening prayer some, somewhat like uh, you know, like four perhaps see like four o'clock four thirty five o'clock because in that part of the world in the, win- in the dead of winter, it's going to get it gets dark very very soon. It gets dark sometimes, as I said, even around f- sometimes even around four you know four four thirty, and it, hap- it that also happens that also happens in the American Northwest and the Upper Midwest. So, <clears throat> but nevertheless, he would be catechizing two hours on Thursdays. And then for two hours between the end of the morning, the, the morning prayer service and the evening prayer service. Because he was concerned, I mean, catechi- catechism, pastoral teaching by way of catechism served to strengthen his preaching. And particularly in this, particularly in this way, Catechizing in this way, which was the form, of, which was the form, obviously that his pastoral teaching took, prepared the hearts of people for the public preaching they would hear. If you are, his idea was, all right. If you are taught, if you are, if you are subject to biblical teaching on a regular basis, even on a one-to-one basis, by way of this catechetical method, and especially before the service of worship is to take place, well, you're going to be better prepared to actually worship. You're going to actually know, by the grace of God, as to how you should worship, which also means, therefore, within the context of that, one is going to be better prepared by God's grace to receive the word of God as, as a means of God's grace. So that is, so with respect, oh, that's interesting. Oh, with respect to Greenham, that is how he understood the relationship between catechizing and the preaching of the word. These are not two separate, they're distinguishable, but they're inseparable. Catechizing, catechism was necessary to prepare people to worship well, to worship with his people well, and in that context, receive the word. Now, now for, according to what Greenham tells us in some of his works, this brings us to how he understood the purpose of the catechist. Now, the catechist, as we all know, is somebody who teaches via the catechism. It was simply to make doctrine easy to understand. And the role of the student who's being catechized was to internalize this doctrine through repetition. 
This is why, using the Heidelberg Catechism as an example, that's why it demonstrates this teaching of biblical doctrine and so forth by way of questions and answers because the person being catechized is expected to memorize those responses. But then obviously in the whole process of catechizing, not only is the person just simply um, memorizing and repeating these answers, during the course of that time, the catechist is also explaining what this person has memorized. So, that's all, that was, so Greenham and others understood this, including Baxter and so forth, they understood this as the process whereby the person being catechized internalized biblical truth, making it by God's grace and by the enablement of the Holy Spirit part of him or her. Now, what can, now, what kind of catechism did Green and use? Well, the Book of Common Prayer, and, uh, and here I'm thinking, yeah, here's a Book of Common Prayer, has a, has a very, has a short catechism at the end of it. So really good, so it's not nearly, it's not nearly as long as Heidelberg, certainly not as long as the, uh, it's not, certainly not as long as the Westminster Shorter Catechism even. But it's a decent, it, it's a decent, it's a decent, it's a short, but it's a decent catechism that's foc- that, um, that focuses instruction around the ten, mainly the Ten Commandments and the Apostles' Creed, very similar, uh, Lord's Prayer, very similar to what Heidelberg, you know, very similar in terms of structure of what uh, Heidelberg does as well. <clears throat> and so... What, and so what he and so what he did was, Greenham as a pastor decided not only on what catechism to use, but how he would use it based on the needs of those he was going to catechize. And so towards that end, he <coughs> he with quite a bit of latitude. Use the uh, that prayer that uh, catechism at the end of the Book of Common Prayer towards that purpose, and he didn't just simply use the catechism as it as it coldly was uh, there in the prayer book. Rather, what he did was he took what was there, what was given to him as a resource, and then he adapted it to the unique circumstances of the congregation. That is also something that is something to think about as you anticipate catechizing. <clears throat> it's easy it's easy to take something like the Heidelberg Catechism and say oh and just and then just use that re, just use that period regardless of you know regardless of where of where people are and so forth. Now, should it be used? Should it be used? Absolutely, it should be used. Just like you know, Westminster and other, there are many others that that can be used. But in but in trying to decide on a program of catechizing uh, people in your congregation, take take the resource, whether it be Heidelberg, Westminster, or some other. Take the resource and focus intentionally on adapting that resource to the needs and the level of understanding of the people in the congregation. Is <clears throat> so because now obviously we're not dealing with the first questions, but there are other quite but there are other discussions in the, in the catechism <clears throat> that that may require that may require you as the pastor in relation to the people that you're dealing with. They may require you to maybe adapt or revise those in a certain way that it would be contextually appropriate to the people to whom you're ministering. Because we have to remember, the Heidelberg, I mean, I'm, <clears throat> Heidelberg Catechism is great. I love the Heidelberg Catechism. And I think it's great that you're doing that. But also, all things, but gentlemen, all things being equal, just trying to bring forth by way of application what Greenham was doing here, we have to remember that even Heidelberg Catechism, as great as it was, as great as it is, was nevertheless written in 1563, 
uh, in, <coughs> in the Palatinate uh, in Germany, in the, in the city of Heidelberg, to address certain specific circumstances. Now, does that mean we shouldn't use it? Well, no, of course not. Those are the circumstances. But keep in mind that even these catechisms are also situated. Which means, therefore, gentlemen, by God's grace, you have the liberty to take those catechisms and adapt them and adjust them in the way that you teach them in a way that's going to reach effectively the people you're trying to minister to. That's my point. That's my point. Always remember, you, you as the catechist, you as the pastor, you own these doc you well, for lack of a better way of saying it, you own these documents, they don't own you. So all that to say, gentlemen, always 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 feel free to exercise the liberty that you have to make certain adapt, uh, ad, ad, adaptations with these documents, especially something like the Heidelberg Westminster Catechism, to adjust to the needs of the people you're catechizing, you're ministering to. That's my, that's my point, and that's what, and really, that's what Greenham is doing in his context, especially given the state of the congregation as he found it initially. See that's how pa see that's how pastoral ministry works. And that's some, and, I, and and that's something I think is important for us to highlight, because it's very easy going into a pastoral situation with a preconceived idea as to <clears throat> how things ought to be how things should be done. I've got this prepackaged system of doctrine that I'm going that I'm going that I'm going to that I'm going, to, I'm going to teach everyone in, and they've got, to learn, and they've got to learn it all this way. Guess what, gentlemen? That's, that doesn't always work within certain contexts. Do we teach? Yes. Do we catechize? Yes. Do we use Heidelberg? Yes. Do we, or, or Westminster? Yes. But remember that the context in which you're doing it may also determine this, a certain degree of flexibility with which you use those. That's just an F, that's just F, that's just FYI. <clears throat> just as somebody who, just as somebody who has, uh, who's pastored in a certain section of the United States that, uh, in which there were a lot of things that were very, very unfamiliar to people. And gentlemen, that's and gentlemen, that's the northern that's the northern Midwest of the United States. I imagine that I imagine some of the context here in e very diverse context here in Ethiopia uh, would also would also apply. Just from some of the little bit of reading I was I've been doing, just from a little bit of reading I've been doing in the news at night and early in the morning <clears throat> after devotions. I'm it's just becoming more and more aware. I'm becoming more and more aware of the fact that uh, Ethiopia, regionally, is also very diverse. And so, uh, yes, Samuel. That uh, Samuel, that's a great question. Well, first of all, it, first of all, as a part of the English Reformation, it all would have been it all would have been in English. That was one of the that was one of the hallmarks of the Reformation was to make worship <clears throat> was to make worship especially. And the teaching of doctrine and things like this, vernacular, in other, in other words, putting it in the language of the people so that the people being ministered to would have access to it. So that was, so certainly Greenham as a, as a Protestant, as a Protestant minister working under the Elizabethan settlement would have, would have done exactly that. <clears throat> now, probably what he now now going now what did he do in terms of the catechism? Well, one thing, he used the simplest catechism that was available in his context, and that was the catechism that was appended to the Book of Common Prayer. As I said, it's a very it's much shorter. That catechism is much shorter than uh, than than, he than Heidelberg. <clears throat> 
So he so he used so he used that, and then now we don't know all this. We don't know all the specifics of this, but we also know that he that in, in catechizing he also used the teaching methods that would have been appropriate to the level of those to whom he was ministering. That's another. That's that's another. That's another thing that we understand. Great question. <clears throat> Now, here's now coming back to that question, Samuel. One of the ways in which he kind of adapted the, the prayer book catechism to meet the needs of the people was that he put the ten. It was that he he structured it along the lines Luther did with his small catechism, and that was he put the ten commandments in front of the prayer book catechism. Because if you go to the Book of Common Prayer, you look at that catechism. Uh, it doesn't begin with it doesn't begin with the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> here, here Greenham, in sort of appropriating the the resource he already had by way of this catechism, made a few changes by moving the Ten Commandments or the exposition, pardon me, of the Ten Commandments to the very to the very beginning of that catechism. And there, is a re and there is a reason for this. Now, just, now here, I'm going to ask you, all right? Given the conditions of the, of the church that he found, as a pastor, we're thinking pastorally here, all right? Why do you suppose Greenham would sort of adjust the catechism by moving the Ten Commandments to the very beginning? Given the state in which he found this congregation. What do you think? Uh, yes, familiarity of the Ten Commandments. Now, why do you suppose, given the pastoral situation that he's walked into, as we described earlier, why do you suppose he would want to begin with the Ten? Why do you suppose he want to begin instructing them with the Ten Commandments? In addition, in, in addition to people becoming familiar with them, as you pointed out, Samuel. Go ahead, James. That's exactly right. Yeah. He, Granham is intentionally employing Luther's law gospel dynamic <clears throat> because of the pastoral situation that he's faced. So, he's, so this is an example of him adapting the catechism that's, that in his case was in the Book of Common Prayer to meet the immediate needs of the pastoral situation that he's encountered. Sure. As you, as James, as you very aptly summarized uh, the condition for us, all right? Granham comes into this place, he comes into this place, and it is bad. People don't, people could care less about any form of biblical, of what we would understand to be biblical piety whatsoever. Uh, they don't give a part, to put it in very technical terms, they don't give a flip about prayer. They don't care less about God, about, about listening to God's word. <clears throat> Plus, you've got this little thing called syncretism where they're somehow, they, they somehow are approaching the Lord's Supper in this very superstitious way by way of some bizarre mixture of some quasi-Catholic understanding of that with folk magic. <clears throat> and then, and then um, neglecting, you know, neglecting the, you know, neglecting the Lord's day, and not caring anything about that. So, so yeah, it's. I mean, so we could, James, as you put it, we could summarize that with the word immorality in, on, on many levels and in many ways. And so, as a pastor, Greenham goes into the situation says, just some, um, they've got to be prepared. To receive the gospel first. This is where this is how this is where Luther would be coming from, going back to his employment of this law gospel dynamic. And and by the way, this is what Greenham intentionally does, because it would be his contention, like Luther, that sinners have to be made aware of their sinfulness in order to point them to Christ, who is proclaimed in the gospel. 
Um, Muhammad, you sort of, in your discussion yesterday, you kind of alluded to that. So, from, so when you're walking into a situation like this, as Greenham was, in which people are not, in which people are, could care less about how they live, could care less about worshiping God or right. Well, suddenly coming to them with a promise of good news is not, I mean, and this is how Luther would understand it, and Greenham understood it the same way. They're going to come in, you, you come in just um, with something benign. Oh, here's the good, oh, here's the good news. Jesus, di Jesus died for you. Pfft, that's nice. Give me my, here's, give me my, let me go to the tavern over here and give me my next drink. This is how Greenham would have viewed it. What you have to do is, according to Greenham, pastorally in this kind of a situation, is you've got to confront them with the reality of their sinfulness and how desperate their situation is apart from any other consideration and then upon doing that through a consistent, relentless exposition of the law, whereby you confront, you know, you confront them, you know, you confront them with their hopelessness. You confront them with the desperation of, uh, of, their, of their situation, where their complacency is completely and totally gotten rid of, at which point then, now, they are ready for the gospel. Which, which declares God's free acceptance of them as sinners through faith in, in Christ's work, in Christ himself and his work. Um, just to use another example in this regard, uh, Samuel, a couple of days ago, you sort of alluded to that with, uh, uh, with the Isaiah passage. I mean, I mean, we have to remember, Isaiah, there in chapter 6, was confronted by, the, by God's absolute holiness. And when he is confronted with God's absolute holiness in this, in, by way of this vision, what's, the fir, what's his first... And, and, and then we factor into this, in, into this vision too, or as part of that vision... We see the angel. We see we see the angels covering themselves, or covering their eyes, covering their feet, and exclaiming, "What? Holy, holy, holy!" And then, as Isaiah beholds that, and especially the fact that that these creatures, who are sinless creatures, of all things prostrating themselves before the one who is infinitely holy. When Isaiah sees this, just to review, what was Isaiah's initial reaction? What was it? That's right. Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the, a people of unclean lips. And so it's with that in mind that both Luther and in this case Greenham is employing this dynamic of Luther's with respect to that particular pastoral situation by placing the Ten Commandments at the front of that catechism and kind of making that front and center in his catechetical instruction. Because, like Isaiah, you come into a situation like this, well, it's important that they be confronted by way, they be confronted with their own inherent sinfulness in the light of God's holiness, which God does manifest initially through the law. Because then, and this is where it does, and, and James, to your statement earlier, this is where it does become gospel-centered. It does become gospel-centered because once any sense of self-sufficiency, any sense of self-righteousness is completely and totally 
uh, destroyed by way of the law. And, and, and one is brought to the absolute reality that there, is no, there are no resources uh, that, that he, that, that one has uh, of himself, in himself, to rectify this. Then you share, then you bring the gospel. But, God, but, Christ, but Christ, Christ has fulfilled this on your behalf. Christ has fulfilled this on your behalf. He died for, he died for your violations of this. And by believing that he has done this on the basis of his word, which is the gospel, then God freely, and this is what makes the gospel a promise, God freely accepts you in and through Christ and for his sake. Because henceforth, he looks at you and he sees nothing but the righteousness of Christ. That was what Greenham was thinking in relation to this situation. Any questions or comments about this before we move on? This is, this is Greenham's, um, yeah, this is Greenham's pastoral teaching by way of the catechism and a flexible use of that catechism in the face of the pastoral circumstances that he faced. Now, by the way, just for the, now gentlemen, just for the record, when I, just because I'm, just because I'm highlighting Greenham doesn't necessarily mean that I'm necessarily advocating a, a, a certain rigid position regarding uh, uh, Sabbath observance. Go ahead, uh, A.B. In, in this period? That's a great question. <clears throat> um, now, Greenham, as a, now Greenham, given his orientation, would have preferred something of a, something of a of a strict Sabbat of a strict Sabbatarianism, where one would, you know, they'd close, well, he would want to. I mean, somebody like Greenham would want to. He would want to close. He'd want all the taverns closed uh, there in Dry Drayton on the Lord's Day, and uh, he would want. And he's and, and he would want the cessation of all recreations and things like that on the Lord's Day, so that one would be able to devote himself or herself exclusively to meditating upon God and His Word. Uh, reflecting upon what he or she might have learned and gained uh, from the from the from the uh, service of morning prayer, and then also in preparing for the service of evening prayer, and then he would also expect <clears throat> that time period rather than going you know rather than going to races or rather than going to the tavern, spending those two hours in catechism, preparing <clears throat> for the um, kind of you know applying what they learned from the preaching in the first service and then preparing to worship in the second service. So, so that would be, so, so in that regard um, for Greenham, that would be the kind of Sabbatarianism he would have wanted. Now, now among the, cler now among, uh, the clergy in the late 16th, early 17th century, there was quite, there was considerably divided opinion on uh, and that was one of the reasons why later on uh, in 1618 the Book of Sports was written. Or we kind of alluded to in our overview of the Stuart period in which the Puritans were, most of the Puritans were ministering. Uh, the, book of, the Book of Sports, which was very controversial, uh, that was drafted, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember, was it, I'm trying to remember who drafted it, I think, was it James I? I think it was James I who drafted it. But anyway, um, the, well, according to the Book of Sports, any kind of, all kinds of, um, of recreations were, ben were not only encouraged but beneficial on the Lord's Day as long as one had their priorities right and went to church. So if you went, so if you went to church, if you went to morning, if you, as long as you fulfilled your obligation to go to uh, more, uh, the services of morning and evening prayer, or if this, or if it was, or if it was communion that day, as long as you went to public worship, then, then that fulfilled your that fulfilled your Lord's Day obligation, and then 
and then you could freely enjoy the rest of the day b via various recreations and things like that. That was the whole point of the Book of Sports. And there were a lot of Puritans who, well, well just about all the Puritans hated it. The, 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 le the ecclesiastical establishment uh, promoted it. Uh, James I, obviously, since he wrote it, promoted it. But, um, yeah, but, sab yeah but, but going back to that, uh, A.B., Greenham, as I said, for reasons that we stated here in the late 16th century, Greenham would have, would have wanted that kind of strict Sabbath, Sabbath observance for the reasons that we stated because of his concern, especially for that, you know, that two hours of, or so of catechetical teaching between the morning and the, and the later service. Very good question, but yeah, just for the record here, Sabbath observance uh, in the early 17th century is going to be very, very, very controversial. The 90% Pur of the Puritans want it. They want a strict Sabbatarianism. Cromwell, and for by the way, Cromwell during his Commonwealth enforced it. There's another reason that uh, a, lot of Eng a lot of the English hated his guts, to put it in, you know, to put it very bluntly. Uh, but then, up until that time, m most of those in the many of those in the establishment, leading the establishment, uh, were in favor of recreational flexibility and things like that, as long as one fulfilled their Lord's Day obligation by attending church. Anything else before we move on? Well, first of all, it's going to depend on. You know, it's going to depend on which it's going to depend on which Puritan number one, because the Puritans, as we were pointing out earlier, were certainly not monolithic by any means. Secondly, the Puritans, just like anyone else, have to be situated in their context, and so they are coming. They are coming off a period that was. Um, uh, in which, re in, which Reforma in which Reformation itself was very difficult in trying, in trying to implement. And so, look, using Greenham here as a case study, they walk, into, they walk into a situation, they see all kinds of what they would understand to be moral disarray. So, so, there, so you know, despite what the, what the you know, what the early 20th century American journalist H. L. Mencken said, they weren't, they weren't just a they weren't just a bunch of arbitrary killjoys. They were concerned. They were. It's because they were concerned about not just individual holiness, which was which was certainly paramount, yes, but because they were also concerned about communal holiness, the holiness of the community, and the church then reflecting that community. They did, they did become, they would resort to maybe a certain degree of rigidity to help ensure that. But again, the motivation behind that was so that, individ, so that individuals and communities can more joyfully and freely worship and serve God. I mean, that, for them, that would have been the driving motive. Because, because from our standpoint, especially, and again, I don't, and again, I, I, I want to be careful here because I don't know how, to what extent this will apply here in Ethiopia or Kenya or Somalia. But for the most part, at least in the West, you could say that we live in an increasingly antinomian age, whereby whereby it doesn't, whereby, uh, whereby rather than living according to grace, I mean, arguably we might even be living according to license. Well because, I'm, well, because I'm under grace, it doesn't matter how I live, I can do whatever I want. So, and God will, and because I'm saved, and because um, I'm quote unquote saved by grace, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter what I do. So you see, there's, I mean, so again, we, so because arguably in our own age, particularly in the West, 
and there are and and even evangelicals have something of a libertine understanding of life because they've just succumbed because they they in some cases you could say that they've succumbed to the hedonism of the culture at least of, of Western culture I should say to be very specific um, it would be easy then to look at the Puritans through that light including Greenham in this case and then just call, and then just write them all off as being a as being a bunch of excessively rigid killjoys now on a personal level would any of us want would any of us want to and I'm including myself okay well would any of us want to would any of us want to approach the sabbath or the lord's day in exactly the way these people did i know what my, and i'll be honest with you i know what my answer would be no because i do think i do think at, to be fair and although we're viewing this from our, from the present there is i agree I, I agree with the objection that there could be that there is the risk of legalism because I mean, for instance, even today there are some reformed denominations which which arguably take this way too far, um, even to the point of you know excommunicating somebody for going to a baseball game. And I know that I mean I've and I've 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 I, I and I know that for a fact. So. And I know of a, I mean, I, I mean, again, I'm not going to go in, I mean, since we're being recorded here, especially, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not going to mention names. But I know of a, I mean, I know of a, um, of a 1689 Reformed Baptist Church in Florida, very, very, very strict, in which they've done that. I kid you not. They would, they actually, I, I, from what I remember, they actually excommunicated a family because the parents attended, I kid you not, gentlemen, attended their kids' football game. <laughs> I mean, so, so you're, so I agree, so, so this, so a gentleman, this, you see, gentlemen, this is, a, again, where we have to situate things contextually, because I mean, there's some there's some of these people who who fancy themselves as quote unquote neo Puritans, expecting to impose expecting to impose every letter of this on people, whether it be in Ethiopia, whether it be you know whether it be in you know whether it be in the United States, whether it be in you know, whether it be in Kenya, whether it be in Somalia, whether it be in Mozambique, um, in, 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 the 20, in, in the 21st century. And then what happens is when somebody, when, when, when we try to do that, well, we lose sight, first of all, of what the original intention back here was in that context. And then what, ha and then what happens is you do create, unfortunately, a very, very rigid well, more than excessively rigid legalism, which goes way, 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 way beyond the pale of, of, of this. Because then what happens, because in that situation, you do end up with just this and none of this. Well, for one thing, you're still in that in in this period all right you're still dealing with a christian with a christian society that's one that's one thing you're still dealing you're still dealing with a christian society so although they are it's it's messed i mean you know, put in technical terms it was messed up in a lot of ways it was still generally a christian society and so every and so everybody in this society has a general under, they have a general understanding of no matter how inaccurate it may be in details, so you still have a general understanding 
of what Christian conduct and life look like. And they also have a common understanding to some degree or other of, uh, of Christian teaching. Now, contrast that to today. Were they immoral? Yes, they were immoral, as you aptly pointed out earlier. But, they were, but though they were immoral, they still had a general understanding as to what this was because they still self-identified bizarrely as a Christian society. Today, take your pick. I mean, whether it be, uh, whether it be, you know, whether you know, whether it be Ethiopia, and in this case specifically, whether it be Addis, whether it be the, you know, whether it be anywhere in the West. That's not necessar- That's not necessarily the case. Now, now obviously the situation. Now contextually, the situation here in Ethiopia is very, very is is very complex. Especially with some of the relig- especially with some of the, um, you know, some of the religious, some of the religious dynamic and how that religious dynamic factors into cultural understanding and so forth. Um, whether it be depending on the region of the country, whether it be in its Islamic um, version or expression, or in the or in the ortho- or in the orthodox or in the orthodox expression, and then you throw in then uh, you throw into this mix. Uh, the very you throw into this whole mix, you know, the various uh, penta uh, churches. Well, it becomes well for those reasons, it become that becomes very 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 complicated. Now in the wet now for the most part in the West, you don't have in the West you don't really have that in the West. The West is not only secular but it is. Well, in many cases, you could even say it's even beyond that. And so in the West, there's no, what we understand as immoral, and and rightfully so it would be in many cases, characterizes much of Western society. There's no sense of any common Christian anything. Maybe, 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 maybe in Western Europe, but it's a very, th- it, uh, arguably, it's not even that. The, the only difference is in, in between Western Europe and the United States in this regard is, in Western Europe, they have some, they have some faint historical memory of it, which, they, which sometimes they love, sometimes they hate, mostly hate. In the United, Sta- in the United States, you're dealing, with, you're dealing with something in which Pop culture seems to drive and define everything, and it's certain. And the kinds of things that, that pop culture in the United States drives and defines, I think, f- for anyone who might be somewhat familiar with it, would say that's certainly not the most. It's not. Let's just say it's not the. It, it, it's it's not the be- It's not the most virtuous. We we'll just put it that way. Um, so for those. So all. So James, for that reason. Nobody in the nobody in the United States hardly is thinking in terms of some kind of Christian society, or even in the United States today. You don't have people drawing, sharing at least some common notion, vague though it might be, of Christianity. You might still have you might still have some of that in the southern part of the United States. But that is rapidly disappearing as well. So I mean, arguably they would pro- arguably um, somebody with a, somebody with an somebody with an Oriental Orthodox background here may actually know a bit more about even the most general sense about the Bible and things like this than many of a typical American because because. Because in the because in the in the United States, you've had you have now at least a, a couple of generations that have had no exposure to biblical Christianity of any kind, whatsoever. So for that reason, another another reason this would be completely unheard of. Despite our neo despite our neo despite our neo Puritan friends who think they're who think they're courageously and self righteously. Uh, contramundum against the standing against the world, uh, 
the societal realities are just very, very different. As a, I mean, back here, yeah, they're immoral. But they have, but the pastor can come and say, the pastor can come and, and engage in excessive instructions about the Ten Commandments. And at some point, for at least from a human stand, at least from a human point of view, notwithstanding the work of the Holy Spirit, of course, yeah, they're going to, yeah, they are going to, they will come under some kind of conviction because this is, v vaguely though it might be, it's generally is going to be somewhat familiar because they do self-identify still as a Christian society, a very bad one, but one nevertheless, as opposed to um, postmodern, post-Christian uh, Western society. And again, here in the Ethiopian context, I imagine, and gentlemen, I'd be interested in, in your views on this, uh, it, I imagine it would still be very, very different. Just because here, here in this country, you have a completely and totally different kind, it seems you have a completely and totally different kind of dynamic for the reasons I earlier stated. And I'm sure it would be very, and I'm sure there's some, there, and, and I'm sure if we were to relate this to Kenya, there's a very, in Kenya, there's a very, very different dynamic as there would also be uh, in, um, in Somalia as well.